Uh, well, warm welcome everybody to our Measures of Disadvantage seminar. Great to see so many of you uh, signed up and attending and really pleased that there's uh, interest in the report we released and also um, this issue. Um, so we've got a great um, panel of speakers to take you through uh, the next hour or so, and I'm really grateful to them for giving up um, some time. Um, as some of you may know, I'm, I'm James Turner, the, the CEO of the Trust, and I'll be, I'll be chairing the session this afternoon. Um, so we're going to kick off um, very shortly shortly with um, the presentation from John Jerim, uh, who uh, did the research for us, uh, the research we commissioned from him last year. So he's going to take us through that report that we released a few weeks ago, um, looking at uh, the research, the methodology, but also what he found. Um, and then we're going to go through into uh, a panel, and we have a great panel each of whom is going to talk about um, how they in their organisations look at measuring disadvantage and some of the obstacles they face and the things that they would like to see um, improved. Um, and that panel, I'm really pleased to say, is um, Samina. So Samina Khan um, from the University of Oxford. Also really pleased that we have Chris Millwood from the Office for Students. He, he's given up some time to be with us this afternoon as well. And then, of course, UCAS are absolutely critical in all of this. So really delighted that Karis, Karis Fisher is able to join us on the panel as well. Um, so we'll hold all the questions till the end and there'll be plenty of time for questions. But if you think of them as we're going through um, the next hour or so, please do put them in the, the Q&A function on Zoom as opposed to the chat, because then my colleagues at the Trust will bring them all together assimilate them and so we'll try to get through as many of the issues um, as possible. Um, we'll probably wrap up after an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, depending how much discussion there is. Um, of course it will be finished for the football um, and so you'll be able to join no doubt what is the endless build-up that's on BBC already, um, but it will be finished in good time um, for the match later on. Um, a couple of other bits of housekeeping that I've been asked to talk about as well. If you do want to tweet about um, the, the webinar, which you're very welcome to do, please use the hashtag measures of disadvantage and tag um, at Sutton Trust. Um, and we're also, just for your information, recording the event as well. So we'll share that recording for all of you if you want to look at any of the highlights. And also there are some people who want to be here this afternoon who can't make it. So we're going to be sharing uh, with them uh, as well. Um, so before I hand over to John, I just thought it'd be useful from a, a trust point of view to say a little bit about why we commissioned the research from John and also give a little bit of framing to that report from our perspective as well. Um, so in terms of the reason why we did it in the first place, you know, as you all know, as, as well as anybody, um, universities are using these measures like never before. Um, so are corporates, actually, in fact, you know, this, the, the, the focus of this seminar is their use in terms of university access. But in other bits of the Sutton Trust life, we see them being used more and more by corporates. All of that is really positive in terms of taking account of a student's background, recognizing um, that the level playing field at 18 doesn't exist, and the sorts of education and, and backgrounds these young people come from are very different, and that should be uh, taken into account when various decisions are made. So that's all uh, positive and great progress, I think, over the last 10, 20 years or so. Um, but we at the Trust certainly didn't feel we knew enough about these measures, their relative strengths and weaknesses, and particularly how they relate to income and material poverty, which is why we commissioned this particular piece of work um, from John. So we did it to inform our own work and our own targeting of our programmes, but we also hope it's useful to the wider sector, to universities, to lots of our friends working in other access organisations as well, which is of course why we, we ran uh, the seminar. And of course, this issue of context and background and how you look at students' disadvantage is particularly important at present in light of coronavirus. We know from our research and the research of many other organisations that the educational impacts of the pandemic have been felt unevenly and they've been felt disproportionately in the poorest communities. So again, how we look at that issue and how we take that into account is certainly relevant to this afternoon's um, discussion. Uh, in terms of the framing, just from a, a certain trust point of view, just a, a couple of points I want to make. Um, I guess the first point is, you know, we absolutely recognise that the measures and metrics are used for, for different reasons, for different purposes. And some of those interrelate and some of them are quite standalone. Um, so as, the way I look at it is at a very high level, a sort of a macro level, they're used to, to monitor progress, 
to identify big trends and inequalities that need some sort of policy intervention. And, and we think that is important. You know, a big reason that we've seen so much progress on access over the last 10 or 20 years is certainly because of the work of universities, the work of schools, the work of you know, access charities and organisations. But it's also been driven by government interest, also being driven by the OFS's role as a regulator. And so that perspective of accountability, transparency, a laser like focus on some key metrics is really, really important. So that's a sort of top level. Then, as we see it, there's a sort of middle level. And that's around the targeting of programs and how these measures are used for that. And so where is the critical mass of young people which would benefit from outreach support, would benefit from access work? You know, which schools, which communities are they in? And that is equally very important because you need to decide where to spend your marginal pound. And we know that well-off parents are very good at identifying opportunities and helping their own children access those opportunities. But we don't want these initiatives to be gap wideners. We want them to be things that help those most in need and give them that extra boost. Um, and then I guess the, the, the final of my three layers, I suppose, is around how these measures are used for really high stakes decisions around individuals. You know, so who, for example, gets a, a differential offer at university? Who gets um, particular consideration in the admissions process? And this is where it is obviously especially important um, that we know the strengths and weaknesses of those measures and we know how accurate and reliable they are. Uh, I think John's report um, particularly focuses on that, and that's what we asked him to do, but I think is relevant for all three of those layers. Um, and then the very final thing I, I, I'll say before I pass over uh, to John is that, you know, the trust, you know, we completely recognise that um, what affects participation in university isn't just about income. You know, so we're a charity focused on helping socioeconomically disadvantaged young people and we would make the case that poverty is the driver of many many of the inequalities that we see in our system and many of the unequal outcomes we see for young people but of course poverty interacts with other factors you know geography school type school performance parental background um, parental occupation you know education level you know not to mention you know big factors like um race and gender as well so um for that reason, you know, like many of you, we don't just look at one measure in isolation for our work. We know we use a basket of measures to try to account, take into account that rich background that a young person would have come from. And there are lots of interrelating factors. So we're not saying in any of this that um, income should trump everything else. I think it's right to take that sort of holistic view. Um, but when we're looking at these measures and when we're making decisions based on them, particularly when they are high stakes, you know, we do feel we need to know, certainly as an organisation, you know, what they are measuring and how they are measuring them, how accurate it is, because that goes to the heart of whether it is fair to use them in the first place. Um, so that's all I'll, I'll say as a bit of framing. I'll pop back on screen after John has spoken to, to introduce our panel and get the Q&A up and running. But I'll pass over to John, who's going to speak for 15 minutes or so. Uh, and again, from us at the Trust, John, thanks very much for your work on this and thanks for your time this afternoon. Lovely. Thank you, James. So hopefully you should all be able to see my uh, slideshow now. Do you see that, James? Yes, we can. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you for my best check first. So, yeah, this is the research that I did uh, on behalf of the Sussex Trust, looking at how different measures capture long term uh, poverty, how different proxy measures capture long term poverty. So the motivation behind this, I think James just set up very well. We want to target children from disadvantaged backgrounds with our policies and our initiatives. And so to do so, we need a good measure of disadvantage. Um, we can argue what measure of disadvantage should be preferred, but arguably ideal measure are those children who've lived in long term poverty throughout their time growing up. Um, of course, we don't have access to such data, not only you guys, but us researchers, we don't usually have access to such data uh, often as well. So we have to make do with some proxy measures instead. 
And from both, I guess, an academic, but also a policy perspective, we want to know how well these proxy measures capture what we really want to know, and that's whether children live in long run poverty or long run disadvantage. So how do we measure long run disadvantage in our work? Well, we take the average family income from when the children's age one, three, five, seven, eleven, 11 and 14 using data from the Millennium Cohort Study. And then we define those as from a permanently low income background as those in the bottom 20% of this long run average income distribution. And we ask, how well do our various proxy measures, and we consider several of them, capture this bottom 20% of long run poor families? Now, these are the kind of selection of proxy measures that we considered within the report and with the academic paper behind it. Some of these will look very familiar to you, such as uh, Polar, IMD, IDACI, uh, ACORN, Others like the Carstairs Index and the Townsend Index may look unfamiliar and they're more used in kind of uh, medical uh, circles. How we've used each of these proxy measures to begin with is we've taken essentially for most of them the bottom quintile, so the bottom 20% on the proxy measure to see how well it lines up with uh, the bottom 20% of the long income, income distribution. Um, there are some caveats to that. So let's take in in, uh, ACORN, for example. And there we've used the definition of poverty on this proxy as all those within category four and five. Now, one of the implications of that is for most of these proxies, we're taking the bottom 20% of individuals defined as disadvantaged on each of them. But for some of these other measures, most notably ACORN, it gets up to around 50%. And this is how some of these measures are used within contextual admissions. But that will kind of, the importance of this, I suppose, will come through in some of the stories that I tell in the graphs later on. The first thing uh, I ended up doing was look at how well each of these proxy measures correlate with long run uh, poverty. And this is the correlation coefficients that you get, where a correlation of one equals perfect correlation, i.e. very good, and zero means no correlation, so the measure is not very good at capturing long run poverty. And as you can see, kind of these measures fall into three separate groups. The first comprise of income, so income at only one single year. Um, the number of years the child has been eligible for free school meals during their time at school and uh, the ACORN measure. So these three measures correlate reasonably well with long run poverty particularly interesting to note that having years that children are eligible for free school meals is pretty much just as good as having actual income from a single year to measure long run poverty. Whoops. Um, these kind of measures in the middle are all much of a muchness. There's not a lot to tell between them. Polar and Tundra kind of stand out as particularly poor measures or poorly correlate with long run uh, income and long run disadvantage. What we may, may then ask is how accurately can we identify children who lives in poverty with our proxies? So to do this within the report, we take a look for each proxy measure at the true positive rates and the false positive rate, which I know makes it sound a little bit like COVID testing, but you can kind of draw an analogy here. So in this kind of uh, cross tabulation, what we have running along the top here is whether children truly live in poverty, i.e. are truly in the bottom 20% of the long run income distribution, and whether they're not in poverty, so they're not in the bottom 20%. And then for each of our proxy measures and using the index of multiple deprivation here as an example, we have whether this proxy measure identifies the child in poverty and whether the proxy measure doesn't identify them as being in poverty. So this green cell here, 43.7%, is the true positive rate. It's the percentage of children who are in poverty that our measure, our proxy measure, captures or says, yes, this person's in poverty. Uh, in poverty. The red is the false positive rate. So in reality, 
these children don't live in poverty, but our proxy measure inaccurately, inaccurately records them uh, as if they are living in a low income background. And what we want any proxy measure to do is maximize the green, maximize the true positive rate, and minimize what's in red, the false positive rate. So what we can do is that all of our measures produce this and present it on the graph. So running along the horizontal axis in this graph is the false positive rate, running up the vertical axis is the true positive rate, and what we want to be, an ideal measure, would be up in this circle in the top, i.e. we have very few false positives and almost all true positives. So we accurately capture from a long run disadvantaged or low income background. Where we don't want to be is anywhere near this line, which basically says, well, is the 45 degree line. So the probability of being a true positive is the same probability as being a false positive, i.e. It, the measure doesn't allow us to tell the difference between a low income background child and a non low income background child. And what you can see here is well, ACORN and the uh, open area classification measures stand out up here with a particularly high true positive rate, but also a high false positive rate, and more so than the other measures. That's partly reflective of this point here. They end up categorizing more children into disadvantage than the other proxy measures. Again, we see income and free school meal eligibility performing very similarly. Most of these other measures kind of cluster together with not much difference between them. And the polar and tundra measures stand out as being particularly poor proxies for long run poverty. What I am thinking about this is, okay, for these measures, currently, just use the bottom 20% of the distribution on the proxy measures list of them. How about if we use these measures in inverted commas optimally? And what do I mean by optimally? I mean by having the kind of cut point so we maximize the true positive rate while minimizing the false positive rate. So getting using the measures to get as close to this green circle up there as po possible. So if I take an example, let's just use the index of multiple deprivation. Instead of taking what we usually do is just the bottom 20% of the iron distribution, we take roughly the bottom third instead. That's the optimal point to use the IMD to get as close to this green circle as, pos as possible. It maximizes the true positive while minimizing the false positives. Now, if we reproduce our graph uh, doing this, we get this graph here. Same as before, where we're comparing our false positives to the true positives. We want to be as close to here and not close to, particularly close to the line. Um, when we do this, we can see the best measure is that having income from a single year at age 14 followed by free school meal eligibility. And then all these other measures seem pretty similar. FSM has a similar true positive rate to these, but a lower false positive rate. And again, Holer and Trunder um, stand out as particularly um, poor measures in terms of capturing children in long-term poverty. The final thing that we did was ask, well, how much bias is there in each proxy measure? So, we show clearly here that there's some misclassification by each of these measures, but this misclassification isn't likely to be random. So we look at how each of the proxy measures, uh, the bias in each proxy measures by a series of characteristics such as ethnicity, whether the child lives in London, coming from a single parent background. That's summarized in this table here, where obviously the cells in green uh, refer to uh, better performing measures uh, with less bias and red refers to worse performing measures in terms of more bias. And the actual figures refer to the extent that uh, indicate how much more likely the group is, so say children living in London, is to come from a permanently low income background having conditioned upon the proxy measure. 
So using Hola and London as an example, Londoners are 13 percentage points more likely to actually live in income poverty than those children living elsewhere in England, having taken into account their differences in terms of the polar disadvantage measure. Now, what you can really kind of see here is there's a lot of bias for many of these characteristics, uh, for many of these proxy measures or many of these characteristics. Again, polar and tundra, tundra stand out as particularly poor, um, whereas free school meal eligibility out of all the proxies considers perform relatively well. Uh, and it leads me to kind of the discussion points around these uh, various different proxy measures. This question is about which we should use, how we should use them, i.e. where we should put the cut points, and possibly whether we should be using these uh, multiple proxy measures as well. It's very tempting to use multiple proxy measures, but I would encourage anyone thinking of doing so, you need to be thinking about the trade-offs and how you use them. So we may increase our number of true positives, but we may also increase the number of false positives at the same time. So we need to think about those trade-offs. Um, and it's clear that universities need better data than just the area level proxies that they currently have to make improvements. And I, along with others, would advocate the needs for supplying universities with the number of years children have been eligible for free school meals. It would be a big improvement over what's currently there. It's already sitting there in kind of government administrative records. It's cheap, quick, easy to use. And in my view, would probably be preferable to actually getting income data from individuals from a single year, because there's more likely to be fewer data protection issues and fewer issues with certain amounts of kind of uh, missing information, such as data for the self-employed. Um, I think I'll leave it there with the presentation, James. Great, thank you very much um, for that, John. Um, having said that we'll leave the sort of technical questions to the end, there are a couple that have just come in. So while, while, while it's fresh in people's mind, maybe I'll just pose those to you if that's okay. Um, I think you've met, you've, you, you answered this one just now, John, but we, we, we have a, a question here about if you combine more than one measure, for example, free school meals and index of multiple deprivation, do you get greater predictive power in terms of that relate, the relationship with, with uh, poverty. Yeah, sorry, I've now flipped back to my slides to kind of show some stuff around this. So there's it's one measure here that does this, and that's this, uh, what I've called the IFS measure of socioeconomic status index. Now, this hasn't been used in widening participation, but it has been used in academic research, and it actually um, combines together information on free school meal eligibility, um, some census information, some stuff from ACORN as well, into one, and then kind of converts it into one continuous scale. So we have looked at that. Actually, it doesn't seem to do that much better than lots of the other measures, at least in types of the, the type of stuff here that kind of um, I've shown you. However, in the kind of uh, academic paper behind this, we did find this IFS measure to be particularly good in other ways. So free school eligibility, for instance, is really good at measuring children from disadvantaged backgrounds, rubbish in terms of telling part children from middle income and high income backgrounds, where this IFS measure is actually kind of um, better suited. So I hope that answers that question. Great, thank you, thank you, John. Um, and there's there's one more I'll just ask now before, and I'll let other people add add them, and we'll come back to you at the end. But um, someone just wants absolute clarity on what your definitions of disadvantage and poverty are. So the point they're making is that measures and definitions are different things. So so what are your definitions of disadvantage and poverty? <laughs> I measure. Is probably the easiest thing to give you and that's taking the income that was reported at seven points during the children's childhood taking an average of that and then taking the uh bottom 20 percent of that average income measure having said that we've done this other, uh, another way within the paper where we've taken a combination of income education and social class uh, and created a kind of an alternative multi-dimensional measure of disadvantage from that. 
and we get pretty similar findings and pretty similar results. I think that hopefully answers your question. In terms of the paper, I suppose I'm talking very much about socioeconomic disadvantage, quite clearly. Great. No, thank, thanks, John, for answering those couple because they were very related to the papers. So I thought I'd get those in now. But um, if I could now actually just ask our, our panel uh, to, to sort of virtually join us. Um, and I think, um, first of all, we're going to ask um, Samina, please, just to give us an overview of how you measure disadvantage at Oxford and also some of the things you might like to see change or some of the obstacles you have in order to do that even better. So I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Samina. Thank you, James, and thank you, John, for the research, which we have found immensely useful at Oxford. Um, we are very interested in being able to measure and identify students who are from disadvantaged backgrounds. And we use the data and the information for a number of reasons. And James has already mentioned some of them, but I'll just reinforce what we do here at Oxford. Um, we do use them to monitor trends and progress that we've made particularly in reporting to the OFS, we are required to do that and we are required to use Polar and I hope Chris will be able to mention more on that. Um, we also do use it to target our access, access programs. We are looking for students who need the most support from us. So we, at, we do use Polar uh, measures um, to help us identify uh, the students who benefit the most from our programs. With access programs, we are more fortunate in that we are able to ask more detailed information and get that verified. So we can ask in terms of number of years the students who might have been eligible for, for FSM and that we can get verified by the school, which is very helpful. Um, so also we use it for measuring um, uh, academic uh, potential uh, to better understand a student's academic um, attainment. Um, and this happens during the admission cycle. Admission cycle timelines are very tight, so we're very much reliant on information that we um, can use straight away rather than uh, relying on self-verified information. Um, so those are some of the reasons why we are very interested in data and to help us to contextualize our access programs uh, to measure progress we're making and also you be to be used to help us identify uh, candidates from the most disadvantaged backgrounds when they apply to us. Um, we, as you probably know, interview um, all our candidates who apply to us um, for, and everybody who's been made an offer will have been interviewed by us at least once. Um, we get something like 24, well, in the last admissions round, we had 24,000 applicants applying for 3,300 places. So we have to use something to help us identify students um, in terms of their backgrounds. So what do we use? We use um, information um, that is uh, school-based. and We also use information that is um, based on the applicant's neighbourhoods. So we use postcodes. So in terms of school information, we use um, pre-16 uh, uh, GCSE performance. Um, we also use post GCSE 16, um, post 16 A level performance. That helps us to uh, help to identify the school in terms of the, the school background that student, student has applied from to give us an understanding of, if the, of their GCSEs to help the, to contextualize those. We also um, look at percentage eligibility for FSM at the school. So, what proportion of the pupils? Are, for, are eligible for FSM. We use this in the absence of having individual level FSM um, data, but this is the closest we can get. Um, from our research, it shows that if a school has a high proportion of uh, eligibility for FSM, then it's more likely to have um, students who are from disadvantaged background. Of course, there are limitations to this, we are aware of that, but in the absence of actual individual level FSM information, we do use this. We use ACORN, um, it, sorry, turning to um, applicants' neighbourhoods and postcodes. We do use ACORN. We have been using this for um, a number of years. And uh, so it's um, flaws. The disadvantage with this, of course, is that you have to pay for it, but the, we, we pick up the ticket for that. Um, and we also use POLAR because actually we're, we're required to. We are aware of the flaws of POLAR. Um, 
Of course, there are limitations to everything that you use, as John has already pointed out. Um, so therefore, we rarely use anything in isolation. Other information that we use in terms of our admissions round, um, because as James has already said, this is high stakes in terms of, of, of use of contextual uh, information. We do uh, ask for care experience and we do verify this. We do ring the school uh, the applicant has applied from and, and check that because quite often, well, not often, but sometimes just because a student has a parent they feel it's cared for, so they tick the box. So that's why we always ring up and find out um, and verify that information. We use um, other um, personal information which is required in terms of disability, mitigating circumstances, all of that is useful for us in terms of contextualizing um, admissions and deciding who should be shortlisted. Um, academic references are also important to us. So how do we use it in the admissions round? It's mostly used at the thresholds. So where we have candidates who are at the threshold of being invited for an interview, then we do dig deep to look at um, who are those from the disadvantaged backgrounds and where we should be contextualizing their GCSE performance and any other performance in terms of tests they might have done for us if, if the course requires one. And it helps us to, to, um, to understand the background that the student has um, come from in comparison to others who have also applied for that course in that year. We would very much um, like to have um, a number of years of FSM eligibility. We know it's available on the MPD. We've been lobbying as well as many other colleagues have for a number of years to see if we could have that via UCAS. It would give us that granular information that we are very much interested in to help better understand the students who have applied to us. Household income, um, as the report shows from John, is also useful. Um, it, we would be more than happy to receive that as well. Um, if there was any way of students loan company collecting that information earlier in the admission cycle, we would welcome that so that we could have it as part of the information we received from UCAS on the UCAS form. Um, other information that would be useful, again, it would have to be verified. Uh, ideally, first generation to higher education would also be useful. Um, children in need is also useful to know. I understand it's a complex, um, it's a complex measure, it's a complex definition, but if it could be verified, we would appreciate that as well. Um, so there's a number of things we will have on our wish list. It is about getting that individual level information that would help us uh, to better assess um, who should be shortlisted for interviews. We're less interested in making contextual offers. It's something that we feel you know, more re research should be done to better understand um, what a contextual offer is um, and how low um, a particular disadvantage um, could then say how many uh, drops in grades that should uh, uh, then uh, necessitate. Instead of contextual offers, Oxford has um, moved to offering a foundation year uh, where students, because of their disadvantage, um, background or experience, don't get the grades they could have done. Um, we feel then we would put a year in place to help them uh, catch up and um, fall into the first year of, of study. So that's what we're exploring. The other thing just to mention with um, reform to admissions, PQA, PQO, we are thinking about how contextual information could be used in that um, new way of, of, of admitting students. So hopefully that gives you an idea of what we use and also gives you an idea of where we use it and some of the wish lists uh, that we would like to, to see come to reality. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, um, Samina, for that. Um, perhaps, Chris, I could pass over to, to you now for the sort of the, the OFS view. Um, that would be great. Thank you. OK, thanks, James. Uh, thanks, Samina. And, and particularly thanks to John for the for a really excellent presentation and research. And, and of course, this is just kind of one of the areas in which Sutton Trust is is influential work on apprenticeships, postgraduates and the effects of the pandemic all getting a lot of t attention, quite rightly. Um, uh, I thought I'd start just by saying that what, what, the most common question that's raised with me about access regulation is why so much money 
is being spent on this, but there's so little evidence on the outcomes from it. Um, that influenced um, quite a lot of the approach that we've adopted in the OFS. And it's perhaps worth just running through the dimensions of that. So firstly, publishing a public access and participation data set, which is intended to help universities and their students and others understand how they're performing in relation to access and participation and to produce what we call an honest self-assessment of that within their plans. Um, secondly, a stronger focus on outcomes in terms of the progress actually made in relation to reducing inequalities um, and the inequalities they, they demonstrate in their own self-assessment rather than just inputs such as spending and, and the amount of activity. Um, thirdly, extending the focus and interest of regulation, not just to access, but also what happens to students during and beyond their studies at university. And then fourthly, setting stronger expectations for evaluation, um, particularly in relation to outreach and financial support for students and, and supporting a national What Works Centre, which started life in King's College and is now an independent charity. Most universities are now running five year access and participation plans on the basis of those changes, but nearly all of them in different ways have points of intervention where they're reviewing the objectives in light of analysis. Um, they're undertaking of particular issues, improvements to data. Um, and we're also updating the national data set with new measures as we have enough robust data for it. So we are expecting some variations to plans during the coming years to, uh, to account for new sources of insights and data, but also, of course, to respond to some changes that might be needed due to the pandemic. One thing I really need to make clear for this discussion is the basis for OFS regulation of access and participation through the Higher Education and Research Act and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the regulations that govern access and participation plans. And I'll flag three things from that. So firstly, OFS is required to protect academic freedom in relation to university admissions. So the measures we use in our regulation should not determine individual decisions about the entry of any individual student, which must always be based on their specific achievements, their circumstances and their potential. And of course, measures of different forms may be one factor in all of that. Um, the Act also prescribes, it stops OFS from, from, um, from telling universities how they must use their funds. Uh, and of course, that's particularly the case for tuition fee income uh, through which universities fund their access and participation plans. So we can't, for example, move money from universities into schools, however valuable early intervention may be uh, for educational attainment and progression. So OFS is the regulator of higher education, it's not the regulator of schools. Um, the third element is that the Act frames our access and participation duties in terms of groups of students who are underrepresented in higher education, not individuals or groups who are otherwise disadvantaged, for example, due to their household income or their socioeconomic status. Um, although those factors can, of course, influence underrepresentation in higher education, uh, albeit interesting to see, for example, through the Education Select Committee's report last week, how much variation there can be. A polar is a place-based measure of higher education participation, so it identifies underrepresentation as we're asked to do through the Act. Uh, beyond that, I would also say that place matters. Uh, so communities influence education and education influences communities. Most polar quintile one areas are in and ex-industrial towns and parts of cities across the North and Midlands and they're in coastal towns and it's no coincidence that those places which have not benefited from higher education expansion are also the priorities for levering up. That's where you will find what some people call the other 50%. So polar can be used to target work and understand performance but like all place-based measures it shouldn't be used on its own to make decisions about individuals. And, uh, and it's important, as a number of people have said already, to, to look at a basket, to look at a number of indicators. So that's why IFS is doing further work to look at new experimental measures, uh, tackling groups such as care experience students, 
looking at type of school education within different places and looking at an associations between characteristics measure which will bring together issues like place, race and ethnicity, sex and indeed free school meal status and we of course also support the case for universities having access to free school meals data uh, because that's an important indicator in itself. If we can get that mix of measures then I think that will give us a more balanced picture of underrepresentation. But of course, it's underrepresentation that's the question we've been asked to address through the Act. That's it from me. Thanks, James. Look forward to the discussion. Great. Thank you very much, um, Chris, for that. Um, and last but not least, um, Karis, can I pass over to you for a, a UCAS view on this, please? Yeah, great. Nice to uh, meet, uh, in inverted commas, everybody. Um, so firstly, um, you know, UCAS really welcomes this research in the Sutton Trust, um, you know, really helpful uh, contribution to understanding what, what works um, in terms of widening access and participation. Um, as as Samina and, and Chris have already articulated, um, higher education admissions is, is far more than, than just an assessment of qualifications and grades. And, and certainly as we approach uh, this summer, that's certainly never been more, more relevant. Um, there's a huge amount of uh, contextual data and information that's, that's already used, um, as Samina's already talked to, in terms of everything from background information to that that's personal to the individual and most commonly found within um, their UCAS uh, personal statement and indeed reference. Uh, we also uh, at UCAS fully um, understand the challenges that are outlined by the Sutton Trust in, and uh, we ourselves have long since um, advocated for a use of more comprehensive measures of disadvantage to support widening access and participation. Um, for example, we did some research ourselves back in 2015, which um, focused on polar and, and the fact that um, it could lead to uh, what we've termed uh, blind spots um, in assessment. So, uh, for example, if you look at the third quintile, uh, where students might commonly neither be deemed to be advantaged or disadvantaged, our research found that 10% of those students um, are white, white males in receipt of free school meals, which are obviously characteristics that are perhaps most typical among those showing the lowest progression rates uh, to university. Um, and that's why uh, we developed the Multiple Equality Measure, or MEM. Uh, so first produced back in 2015, uh, I'm sure many of you are already familiar with the MEM, but it, effectively it brings together a range of equality factors to provide what we feel is a, a truer sense of an applicant's uh, circumstances and we um, continue to work with the sector to champion MEM um, as being what we hope will um, evolve into the default mechanism for uh, measuring disadvantage. Um, this, uh, this cycle we've worked with the Department for Education building on some work last summer to enrich uh, MEM to include uh, free school meal eligibility alongside Polar 4, Idaki and school type. Um, and in addition, and, and obviously in response to the, the report and, and as uh, Chris and Samina have already articulated that the benefits to the sector, we continue to discuss with uh, the department about how to enable the lawful sharing of verified free school meals data um, on its own with, with universities and colleges. Um, and that's in addition to thinking about how we can better capture data that reflects individual applicant circumstances um, through as uh, the mechanism of, of self-declared um, application questions. Our um, recent report, uh, what happened to the COVID cohort that was published um, in December now, did talk about the great progress that's been made in widening access and participation that I always think it's really nice to reflect on in these discussions. Um, you know, the sector has done a huge amount of work um, you know, noting the huge amount of investment as well that, that Chris touched upon, and that's seen the, the MEM gap since 2010 narrow by uh, more than 25%. Uh, nevertheless, um, we, our report also talks about how progress has slowed in recent years, and the MEM equality gap is now narrowing by an average of 1.1% year on year uh, since 2015 versus 4.4% across the previous five years. Um, and it's also um, true and perhaps unsurprising that the gap is most significant at higher tariff providers where 
disadvantaged uh, students as measured by men remain uh, around about 12 times less likely to, to enter um, those providers. Um, uh, also just wanted to say that this, um, and really I think helpful to have this discussion reflect on the fact that it isn't unique to traditional higher education and as um, technical education and apprenticeships grow in popularity I think some of these lessons learned can certainly be carried over into that space and the more we can all do to support that um, the better and um, you know continued progress in widening access and participation must absolutely be central to proposals around admissions reform as well. Um, so that's a kind of overview of, of UCAS in terms of our, what we see from the data and the, the services that we're, we provide and are hoping to um, develop further. And uh, yeah, really happy to uh, be here and, and be part of the conversation. Great, thank you very much, um, Karis. And if you've got any questions for, for John or the panel, some are coming in, but please do put them in the, in the Q&A box and we'll come to as many as, as we can. Um, just one thing to start us off in terms of the discussion, um, and it's quite micro, but it's come up um, a fair bit in, in the presentation and also in Samina's comments, is um, uh, how we actually get free school meal data to universities, um, ideally through UCAS. So one of the potential outcomes we want to discuss with this group is whether, and lots of things have been tried, but whether a joint letter to the Secretary of State might open up some avenues there. And my colleague who's coordinating that will put her email address in the in the chat box so anyone who's interested in supporting that letter um, can sign up and see the draft and see if they want to support that um, so so we'll, we'll be doing that if there's a, if there's support for it but just I guess particularly for me that when either our panel either Karis, Samina or Chris what have been just briefly for our um, for our people who are attending this what have been the obstacles to getting that free school meal data to universities, you know, in a nutshell, because I know it's not a new issue. Um, I can I can start. I think so. I just I'd just like to say that um, I think um, conversations are ongoing. So um, actually, um, had a meeting today about this very topic. So it's certainly something that we're you know we've uh, you know long since been in favour of and are really hoping to facilitate in the in the um, uh, you know, not too distant future. In terms of barriers, um, you know, very much in that legal um, data protection space, um, issues around consent um, and how to secure securely and lawfully um, make the uh, make the necessary um, processes and agreements in place in order to to allow for the transfer of, of that information. But I certainly feel like. Um, you know, we are really working towards a, a good outcome on that. Um, and we're really pleased that we have been able to um, supply um, the information within the MEM um, as of last summer. Um, so that for us is a really positive step forward and, you know, absolutely understand that it would be really helpful to supply that as individually as well. So um, that's where we are from the kind of UCAS uh, perspective. Thanks, Karis. Chris, did you want to come in on that point as well? Yeah, so I mean, I, I would say three things. Obviously, there's a set of um, data protection issues to work through, which I'm sure are not straightforward and for which um, the department owning the data is rightly accountable. Um, the second is, I think, I think there's a strong case, uh, you know, reflecting on some things um, John was saying at the start about being able to, to identify individuals through this data, uh, which, 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 which might, might support some, some, some of the ways of thinking in government around equality of opportunity, but also, of course, the join up between what you do in higher education and what's happening in schools, given how influential the free school meals population is for the targeting of various activity in schools. The last thing I was going to say is, is I do still think the sector and, uh, uh, and, and bodies like yours, James, have to keep making the case for contextual admissions. So, I mean, I think you've articulated very well in terms of, you know, public examination results not being the only way in which the most disadvantaged students demonstrate their potential. So it's about potential, crucially, um, you know, potential to achieve on the course. 
and I still think we we constantly have to make that argument on those grounds and and how how this data will help with that. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and Samina, uh, please come on that point. But also you said on, on the contextual admissions, contextual offers point that you felt that more research was needed. So again, it'd be interesting to know what you think that should look at. First of all, if I could just uh, contribute towards the use of FSM. I think one of the things the sector has to make very clear is that the FSM data won't be used for marketing. That's one of the things that we constantly get questioned on. We say we want it to use it to help inform admissions at the point uh, in the admission in the um, UCAS cycle. So I think if we can give some reassurances about how that information will be used, it might further help the DfE to come to a decision where we do eventually get it. Um, just come back to your point about contextual admissions, and that's therefore by that we mean uh, the offer is changed for those from um, particularly disadvantaged backgrounds to achieve a slightly lower offer um, in terms of their A-levels. I would like to see more research on this. I think there's a lot more that can be done. I know Vicky Bolivar has done some work on it. I think more work is warranted, particularly in terms of then looking at student success once they're on course, um, how they then fare, particularly in um, uh, uh, high tariff universities. And also I think, what support would be needed to help to see that success? Um, I think it's very little at the moment, what additional um, maybe academic or skills building or transition to university, uh, if you take somebody with three grades lower than what your standard offer is, are then required. Um, I think those are the sorts of reassurances I would like to see. Um, at the moment, what Oxford does, obviously I've mentioned the um, Foundation um, year that we're um, opening uh, up and first students will be taken up in 2023. But we're also looking at uh, students in the, the, the uh, application to the, north, to the traditional courses, um, what, how we can transition and help some of those. Um, because I think those particularly from, uh, even if they get the grades that we've asked for, um, there are certain skills uh, that we already put in place, but we've, we're trying to formalise that now and put in a programme where it's almost a two week residential, where the students come in um, if they've come from schools where there perhaps isn't um, further maths being offered, for example, or um, another language being offered. And we do some programmes with them before they start. So this um, helps them not only with academic uh, skills, but it also helps them in terms of making friends and helps them with transition from school, home to uh, uh, university. That programme is called Opportunity Oxford. We've, um, in the second year of implementing it, um, we've taken in the first year, um, something like 100 uh, students. Um, and the feedback has been very positive in terms of the extra support they are getting. Again, this is not contextual offers, but it is taking students from schools that don't traditionally send uh, students to high tariff universities and what we can support do to support them once we've made them offers accepted them and then we want to see them be successful. Great thank you very much um, Samina. Chris I know you need to duck out in a few minutes so I'll just go to some questions I think you know particularly um, for you. Um, so, so one is um, around whether you can see OFS moving away from polar as a key measure and one of the key measures used in access and participation plans. Actually, I'm okay to stay, James. I've managed to find another taxi for my children, so oh. I'll be here throughout, which is good news. Thank you. Um, on on the um, so on the on the measure itself. So uh, I, I mean, really, what I was pointing out in the session was um, we see ourselves working with others like UCAS and and researchers like John developing. Um, more indicators over time you know we've, we've started to do that what we'll normally do is test them as experimental measures and then after a period of time um, uh, publish them as official statistics which are not experimental um, and, and have the discussion with universities about how they want to use them um, I think it's worth saying that quite a lot you know most universities like Oxford as Samina has talked about actually have a number of different targets and measures in their plan so they're not just using one um, and I think we would see during the next year or two 
uh, making more measures available and enabling universities to switch or add and to their, their, to their objectives using those measures as they want to rather than requiring change because they've got kind of five-year plans and we don't want to shift people off their five-year plans if they've been organizing work around it so I think we see ourselves during the period of the current five-year plans enabling universities to come to us and say we would like to use these different measures and helping to support the availability of those measures not requiring change over time but of course there will reach a point where Quite a lot of the plans will need to change because 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 the period is up and we may well you know change the guidance at that point thanks very much um chris um caris there's there's one for you as well which i think you, you touched on in your in your remarks about with the mem measure is it going to be possible do you think for universities to take out from the architecture of mem something they're particularly interested in like fsm eligibility for example yeah so one of the um one of the kind of benefits of the MEM measure, it, which, which may sound um, contrary, is that it doesn't allow for that, if, if, if that, and I'll try and explain, um, in the, the, the modelling allows for all of these factors to be considered simultaneously, which is what allows for the most um, accurate um, output. So if you take... Um, I always think a really good example is if you take um, higher tariff providers as, as a whole, um, whereby um, black students have the uh, lowest entry rates of all of the ethnic groups, and also um, those entitled to free school meals um, have a lower entry rate than those who are not entitled to free school meals. One might therefore assume that, that it would be black students who are entitled to free school meals who um, once aggregated together have a have the have the lowest entry rate at higher tariff providers but that's not actually the case it's white students entitled to free school meals so it's the way in which you can kind of aggregate at and account for all the factors simultaneously that comes up with a more accurate um, picture of disadvantage um, so we kind of see it as one of its strengths that it that it pulls over all those um, elements together rather than focusing on the individual measures in isolation. Um, that said, obviously, FSM eligibility is, is clearly a piece of data that, that we know um, the sector would like us to provide on its own. And, um, you know, we're absolutely able um, and willing to work with the Department for Education to enable that to, that to happen, um, which is what I kind of touched upon previously. Um, separate to MEM, we do supply polar um, in isolation, IMD as well, and um, various school level measures, um, which can be used as complement or um, distinct from, from MEM. Um, I think that answered the question. Thank, thank you, Karis. No, that was um, that was that was really helpful. Um, and Samina, from a from a university's point of view, um, will you use MEM? You know, or do you, do you want that grant? You know, granularity, or are you, are you happy for it being wrapped up? What works from from your point of view? So, Carrie will know. Um, my team has been talking to to you, Cass, with regards to MEM. It doesn't work as well for us. In um, we've tried to to use MEM in retrospectively with with, with our data. Um, it, we really are looking to get the granular individual level data uh, and uh, to help us to, to identify the students uh, from disadvantaged backgrounds. It's not that MEMS couldn't work for us. I think some of the conversations we're having with you, Cass, um, means that uh, you know, there are certain things that would help us. Um, it would be great if there was an off the shelf measure that we could use. Um, but I don't think we're quite there yet, but we're more than happy to work with UCAS and are in discussion with UCAS. Um, so at the moment, we're very much wedded to getting the individual level data at the moment. Thanks. Thanks, Samina. And sorry, John, you, you'd want to come in on MEM as well, I think. Yeah, I might push back slightly on the evidence that MEM is necessarily a better measure than, for instance, years of free school meals. Um, I haven't seen that evidence and, you know, this is why independent academic research is kind of quite uh, important, I feel, because all organisations will always push their own measure. Uh, and I don't, it's got many similarities, I would argue, to the uh, Institute for Fiscal Studies measure that they used, um, that I looked at mm -hmm. in my research. And I didn't see particular improvements there. You do have some things in there, like private versus state school, that isn't in that IFS 
measure it, which might make a difference. But I think that there's still an yeah. open question there whether it w- it it is genuinely an improvement or not. Sorry, I know that's yeah. <laughs> that may be controversial. No, I'm really happy to, and um, you know, really happy to to um, you know, get, uh, involve some of our researchers, and if that would be useful, um, you know, have a kind of further conversation. Um, with our data science team that are kind of doing the um, obviously the modeling and the research um, at a later date on this but I think so rather than seeing MEM as a kind of um, static measure we see it very much as a framework so we're, um, we're we're able to constantly evolve MEM we're able to think about individual MEMs for individual countries for example um, where effects are perhaps uh, pronounced um, so um, it's it's more the the model and the framework as a, a concept rather than the the different the kind of it as a a single measure if that makes sense. Um, so we are wedded to the idea that considering measures simultaneously and modeling for their interactions between them enables a, a more accurate output. Um, when you're looking at disadvantage holistically, obviously in the context of progression to HE. Um, but the, as for the kind of different um, data sets that you can include within MEM, you know, we absolutely think there's progress to be made in that space and, um, you know, always keen to think about alternative data sets that we might be able to use, um, uh, you know, obviously with uh, limitations that, that we're all kind of subject to. Um, so having some really interesting conversations, for example, around virality and how we might be able to um, you know, include data sets that, that account for rurality within MEM, um, particularly thinking about um, Scotland, for example, whereby um, the, the kind of geography is quite different. Um, but I think it'd be really, really happy to put our kind of research team in touch with, with those at the Sutton Trust and kind of further that conversation. Yeah, I think that's useful. And I think um, just to follow up, sorry, just quickly, James, um, you make some really good points there about uh, England, Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland. Because when we talk about FSM, talk about the NPD, we're mainly still thinking about the English NPD. There's the Welsh NPD as well, and equivalent in Northern Ireland, Scotland. So that does complicate things with university access as a UK wide thing where the administrative data is national specific. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, thank, thanks, John and Karis. And just on MEM, just to, to wrap up that bit of the, the, the conversation, one of the, the questions is around UCAS providing more of the underlying data and the technical detail about MEM so that there's a transparency there and an understanding of what it does and doesn't include. So that's just something yeah. to, to note there. Yeah, we, we, um, we have got a technical uh, general report and a technical report, so I'm more than happy to share, uh, share both of those for those who are um, you know, really interested in the kind of modeling and the data behind it, that's all on our website. Great, well, we'll serve to everyone who's part of this uh, uh, webinar, we'll circulate all the right. resources that have been talked about and we'll see if there's any gaps. Um, to zoom out a bit to some of the other questions, there's quite a few that come, up, come in, I'm, I'm keen we get through as many as we can. Um, uh, Professor Daryl Bravenbar has asked a question about the benefits of individualized socioeconomic data. So he completely sees some of the issues with geographically based data, but there are these benefits to this individualized approach to socioeconomic data. So I guess the question is, what are the barriers to gathering individual socioeconomic data? Um, uh, maybe Samina, do you want to come, up, come in on this? And also John, because obviously you've been involved in lots of longitudinal studies as well. So sorry, James, you slightly cut out in there. Was it to ask me what the barriers are in terms of getting? Um, yeah, no, exactly. So what are the barriers to collecting individual level socioeconomic data? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's, it's, we are thinking a lot about this in that, should we be setting up supplementary questions that um, candidates then can fill in at the point they fill in their UCAS form? Other universities do already do this. Um, and this year in particular, we are thinking of dipping our toe into asking for additional individual level um, information directly from the candidate. And that's because this year, you know, um, there isn't going to be um, school performance data available from the DfE because of uh, how grades were awarded last year and it wasn't um, collected. Um, so, I mean, 
we are cautious in terms of, of getting the information directly from the candidate themselves. We would then have to verify it in some shape or form, or we take the risk that if you don't, if you if there are mistakes making, then there may well be consequences as a result of that. I think it would we do encourage uh, schools to give us that information directly as well, um, but it, it then means they using up the information that's on the academic uh, reference to supplies with information. Um, so there are pros and cons to this, and to date we haven't done it um, because we feel that we should be getting this data directly from uh, the DfE um, um, by UCAS, um, hopefully. Um, but it might be that we no longer can afford to wait for that. We might have to look at some way of getting that information directly from the candidates and then setting up some sort of system of, of getting it verified. So that's where we are with our thoughts, James. Okay, thanks, Amina. John, anything to add on that? Yeah, just to reiterate the point, the verification thing is key. How do you verify it? Who do you even try and collect it from? Do you try and collect it from the prospective student or their parent? The student may not know, and I've done work on this, their parents' education level, their occupation may not be able to kind of describe it very well. No one knows their income, like, and it's only going to be a one-year income thing. Mm -hmm. Like I've shown in my presentation, a one-year income thing actually isn't perfect. So, you know, um, I don't think there's a, that, I think administrative data is probably the way to go because this verifiability and gaming the system issue is just going to be so hard to get around. Great, thank you, John. Thank you, Samina. Um, I don't know, panellists, whether you can see, I mean, I should say that John has very diligently been asking, answering lots of the technical questions by text, you know, in, in text and in, in the question and answer. So thank you for doing that. Um, I don't know if the panellists can see the other um, open questions um, rather than read them all out. Um, I won't do justice to them, but I thought we'd start with Neil Spears at the top. And I think the point there is that you can't measure all elements of poverty. There are other complex things going on in these young people's lives, and we must always be cognizant of that, which is a, obviously a good point that stands on its own. But I guess that, you know, one of the questions arising from that is, is how realistically the universe is taking into account that complex background. Because I guess, Samina, at Oxford, you have an interview process, so you probably spend more time per applicant than most other universities. But Chris, I guess from your perspective of the sector as a whole, m m most universities don't have the resources to devote to, to, to looking at admissions in a really holistic way necessarily, because they don't have enough time to look very individually at every circumstance. So Chris, maybe come, come to you first, Matt. So, I mean, for me, it's precisely, um, it, it's the argument for, autonomy in relation to admissions rather than say an admission system that was just based on you know national examination results is you need why why do we have autonomy in relation to admissions it's because universities are best placed to understand the potential of uh, individuals to perform on their courses um, and in doing that I think it's crucial that they understand the context in which um, uh, individuals have been studying uh, how that has influenced um, their achievements to date, what they could contribute when they get to the institution and what they might achieve there. So, so I think it's actually quite a strong argument for uh, autonomy and individualised decision making in relation to admissions rather than a much more systematic uh, process, though it is challenging for universities in a mass system. You know, it is very difficult because of the scale of what they're having to do in the time they're having to do it. Thanks, Chris. Um, Samina, have you anything from an Oxford perspective on that? Yeah, I tend to agree with Chris. I think one of the, the strengths of our HE system is it is broad. It is different. There are lots of uh, of different providers um, meeting the different needs of our different learners and the different routes that they come through. And all of that really points to then having an admission system that's fit for purpose for the different courses and the different universities that um, there is across the UK. Um, and I think, you know, we just need to, to go back to the Schwartz principles um, to say, make sure that we are fair, transparent and robust and all applicants are treated 
you know, equally and fairly, nobody's advantaged or disadvantaged. And it's up to the sector to make sure that, that they can put hand on heart to make sure that's happening. Um, and I think it's, it's it, way Oxford admits would not be suitable for other universities. Um, and I think that's, we've, we've just got to keep, make sure that it, it's um, universities are able to admit in terms of the students and the skills that they're looking for. Thank you, Selena. Um, we've got another question from um, John, John Craven, who asks about um, using school performance data, both as a, as a measure in itself, but also whether it, it is combined. I don't know the answer to this, Karis. Is it, is it in MEM, for example, already? Because obviously the performance of a school is such a strong uh, if impact on a young person's life. So um, I guess, Karis, it would be interesting to, to hear from you how MEM takes into account school performance if it does. And also maybe from John on, on, on what you think about the, the, the strengths of using a, a school performance indicator for things like contextual admissions. So Karis, over to you first. Um, we include school type within MEM, um, but not school performance data. Um, we do provide school performance data separately um, through our um, contextual data service. However, um, as I think Samina has already touched upon um, this year, particularly and well, sorry, last cycle and this cycle, um, there will obviously be a kind of pause, as it were, in that that data isn't actually going to be pub published and therefore publicly available um, or or um, or used for any such purposes. Um, so I guess that in itself um, is an interesting question, given that um, you know there are many reasons why it might be useful data and information, but but certainly um, you know the fact that it will have a hiatus of at least a couple of years. Um, is likely to prove, uh, prove challenging. Um, so we do use school type and we have looked at using um, school performance data. It hasn't shown in our modeling that it, that it, that it adds a certain, uh, adds a huge amount on top of school type, if that makes sense, um, which is why it, um, it's not used um, within the, the current version of the MEM, but it is something that we've looked at and would continue to um, you know, consider and explore as and when um, you know more data is available. Uh, again, another challenge with school performance data is the variation across the UK um, and the different measures that are used and made available. Um, so that that also poses an additional challenge for for, for universities. That I'm sure uh, Samina and uh, can talk to in more detail. Thank you, Karis. John, do you have a view on? Um school performance data and how it could be used in this context? Uh, Half-baked kind of views. I think Karis is uh, said something very useful saying in their modelling it didn't add that much and that was kind of my um, my prior on that as well. Um, I'm guessing there's a bigger conceptual issue here so I, being in Kent I'm thinking about kind of grammar school systems here and so if you took into account what you're saying there then somewhere like Kent any free school meal child, for instance, that got into a grammar school, then you'd be saying we should take that into that fact they got into a grammar school or whatever into account in terms of university entry because they went to a got into a grammar school. So there's all types of kind of perverse things that would, you know, go on. But I don't necessarily know that we would want to take into account, um, take into account or not. So I don't think it would add that much personally but I think it, it needs a broader conceptual point as well before you get into the, all the challenges of how do we measure school quality properly as well because that's what the school before the rationale for including the school performance stuff right a kid disadvantaged kids who's or someone who's gone to a great school has had more input into their education or better input than someone who hasn't so yeah great thank you John um so Samina sorry come on come in on that point I think we do use pre-16 and post-16 school performance data. It is um, it helps with the cohort that applies to us, and this is perhaps where it's it's different for different universities. Um, our cohort that applies to us will be different to cohorts that apply to other universities. Where we do find it particularly useful is when we're looking at GCSEs. Um, when you look at raw GCSE scores, they can be quite misleading. But when we look at GCSEs in the context of the school and in the context of the cohort who has come from similar schools that's applied to us, 
that's where it becomes particularly important so that we can look at prior attainment in a more nuanced way and not just be counting GCSEs or just be counting um, the top grades. And that's where it's important. There are challenges, particularly when you're looking across the devolved administrations, because we don't always have that data from, from the different um, uh, administrations. Um, so it is useful, but you have to look at how you use it. Um, so um, I hope that's helpful. Thanks, Mina. Chris, come on. Yeah, I was going to link across to one of the points that was made in the Q&A, uh, uh, which is one of the things we need to think about is, is, is the different context in which measures are used and for what purposes. So you have understanding performance sector wide and at institutional level and indeed within institutions you have the targeting of outreach you know which schools should you work with uh, then you have bursaries for students and there might be different things in play in those categories and as the comment in the Q&A says what would drive cash for students should be do those students need the cash and that may be a very particular set of indicators Whereas what would drive understanding of tackling underrepresentation in higher education may be a different set of issues. So we need to think about the purposes under the banner of access and participation. Yeah, thank you, Chris. And thank you, Mark. We've got Mark Corver asked a question around that. And of course, Mark's done so much work on the, the data around uh, higher education access. So it's great that he's on, I, I involved in this conversation. Uh, I think we've only got time for one um, final question. because I did say I'd wrap up around, around quarter past. Um, uh, and this is a question um, uh, from someone in Scotland. And they've said in Scotland over recent years, uh, Scotland has taken a more harmonised approach to widening access and contextual me measures. So while the university sector in England is much bigger and more diverse, do the panellists think some level of harmonisation across universities would be desirable or feasible? Um, so that seems like a, a good um, zooming out macro level question on which to, to, to end the discussion. So um, maybe I'll just give it to, to each of you. So um, I don't know, um, uh, Karis, whether you have any view on that from a, a UCAS point of view, or do you take the opportunity just to make any final final points that we haven't had time to cover? I don't know whether it's a UCAS, UCAS, uh, UCAS uh, opinion, but um, I think, you know, I guess I would just highlight how different the context is in Scotland. Um, uh, Whilst, you know, the progress there has undoubtedly been impressive when you look at the um, look at the data over recent years, um, you know, you, the, the environment in which um, Scottish universities and colleges are operating is so different, everything from um, the way in which um, places are, are distributed, uh, funding, um, school system, the entire kind of architecture is, 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 is very different. Um, that said, I think the um, the approach of having minimum entry criteria, um, which is something that that all uh, universities and colleges in Scotland have introduced, um, I believe I want to say two year, two or three years ago, um, putting myself on the spot. Um, you know, I think we, we've certainly seen that that has been welcomed by um, students in terms of understanding um, the criteria against which they are, um, they are looking at. Um, so I think there's certainly something to be said there um, that we can all learn from in terms of transparency around um, entry requirements, et cetera. Um, but I would just, I guess, I just caution in terms of um, one approach that's worked in Scotland being able to be kind of copied across to, to England. Um, so yeah, and thank you very much for, for uh, a very interesting discussion today. Oh, great, thank you, Karis. Thanks for your, your participation as well. Um, uh, Samina, from a sort of, a, you know, your perspective, is, is that harmonisation something that would be good for access? I think harmonisation might make it easier for the applicant to navigate the HE sector in England. Um, I'm not sure how it would happen in England because it's much larger, it's on a different scale. Uh, much more variety of HE providers. We've got um, HE and FE, for example. Um, so I would be a little nervous of, of it happening, but I think there are certain things that could be harmonised. Um, and, you know, the use of certain metrics 
the whole debate that we've had and what's coming out of John's research might be one way of giving us that granular information that everybody uses. Um, but there must, I think, I'm just trying to see it from an applicant's point of view. And I think there is perhaps some benefits to harmonization where we can, so that it's easier for the applicant, particularly who doesn't have support from home and from school to navigate this landscape. Thanks, Amina. Um, and Chris, you've you know dealt with pretty much every higher education institution in England, so you'll have a particular view on this, I think. Yeah, and and of course that's the issue, which is you know when you're talking to Oxford about its access and participation plan and brand new institutions, you know literally brand new institutions with no students yet, uh, it's a real challenge to harmonise. You know, my, my experience of you know working for national funders and regulators for fifteen years is that everybody says can't you get us to do this in the same way and then when you suggest how they go oh not like that you know because of the way it will affect them so that's why you see a lot of things articulated as a framework you know here's a framework within which a diverse sector can operate and I think that's that's the reality in a diverse autonomous sector like ours and of course I think that's what we're talking about today which is which is a framework of measures a basket of measures which will We'll be able to try and make work nationwide with different types of providers and students. Great, thank you, Chris and and John. Any any views on that from you, or any sort of last thoughts as we uh, finish the seminar? Yeah, I guess I'd be positive of harmonisation of the measures used uh, across universities where possible. It would point you in towards Acorn to some extent, I think, because I think that's possibly the most comparable or at least at face value, one of the more comparable that's across the four UK nations. Having said that, um, I think obtaining FSM data across the four nations and doing some work around the comparability of what FSM means across those four nations, and I think there has been some doing that on England and Wales already, but this would need more. I think that would be very beneficial for applicants because they would have more certainty about what it would mean wherever they apply rather than having loads of different criteria all across the sector which you can just see would be a pain when applying for somewhere yeah great thank you john um well thanks very much um to all of the panelists to john for your presentation and for all of you for your time this afternoon and particularly for everybody who's taken part and, and posed questions we, we haven't got through them all um, but what we will do is we'll um, circulate the Q&A because uh, some of the questions have been answered by in, in, in the text. So we'll make sure everyone has access to those outside of this meeting. Uh, all the resources and the research that have been mentioned um, by Karis and, and others will make sure are circulated so that everyone's looking at the same stuff. And of course, our paper, John's paper is available on our website. And there are also a few bits of specific um, questions or uh, to, to, to individual speakers that we'll um, follow up with individually as well. Um, so um, that will sort of wrap up the, the webinar. But as I mentioned, if anybody wants to um, uh, look at our letter that we're gonna be writing to the Secretary of State on this particular issue of access to free school meal data, please contact Ruby. Um, we've already got some signatures to that, so we'll see um, you know, how much support there is and whether it's worth doing, which we think it is. Um, but more broadly, if you have anything coming out of this seminar which you think would be useful in terms of this issue, something you think the Trust could do, uh, more research we could do on it, then please do let us know, um, because we have the shared interest of everybody <laughs> on, this, on this seminar about making sure we target our support to those uh, who need it most. So we're always open to ideas on that. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, for your time. Um, half an hour to watch um, the build up to the England-Germany game. Thank you, Chris, for sacrificing your taxi driving duties to stay on for a bit longer. Uh, yeah, and have a, have a great evening. And thanks very much for, for your participation.